we got these four chapters. some reason it has like the crinkles you think because it's been there for you so think? long and you can't it's like the hardest thing you gotta hurt it it's never going away <laughs> much better That's when they, they that's the bill that comes out after the big bill. The fix I mean oh, yeah. the big bill. I doubt it. I just it sounded weird so I to say it. <laughs> Okay, class, we're going to do it. Um, chapter 21, Mortgages. Um, this is one of those chapters where <clears throat> a lot of this stuff is vocabulary. And it's going to be important that you learn the terms uh, so you can talk to people because you're going to talk to a lot of people in the mortgage business. Um, no, These last two chapters are about financing. Um, mortgages is the primary way. Um, we'll discuss one other quickie, which is chapter 22, land contracts, but we're not going to spend the 10 minutes on that. Um, mortgages. <clears throat> a mortgage is a written instrument. to use real property to secure the payment of a debt. That's important. There must be a debt. You cannot have a mortgage without a debt. A mortgage is invalid unless it secures a debt. The instrument 
that reflects the debt normally is a promissory note. Almost always. You can have a mortgage to secure other types of debts, but 99 times out of 100 or more, it's going to be a promissory note. Um, a promissory note is a written instrument that contains a promise to pay. Every promissory note starts out, the undersigned hereby promises to pay. That's why it's a promissory note. Borrower promises to pay to the lender a debt. And it, it's going to have terms in it. When are payments due? What's the interest rate? What happens if you're late? Um, all kinds of other provisions. But the concept is a promise to pay. You're going to hear it called a note. You hear it called a mortgage note. Promissory note. It's all the same thing. A written promise to pay. Um, it's not mentioned in the materials, but I want to mention for two seconds just because you're going to hear about it. There are recourse notes and there are non-recourse notes in the framework of a mortgage, mortgage transaction, which is what we're talking about. In a recourse note, the borrower promises to pay the debt no matter what. Promises to pay the full amount of the debt. <clears throat> in a non-recourse note, the lender agrees that it will accept the property, the mortgaged property, as full payment of the debt. Which may in fact conceivably be worth less than the debt, particularly when a debt goes under default default interest rate, attorney's fees, court costs, all kinds of huge numbers start to accrue and the debt gets real big real fast. Um, in a non-recourse note, the lender would agree to waive all those things and strictly take the collateral. Yes, sir? Uh, could you define that again, please? Which, one, which part? Recourse non -recourse. and non-recourse? Yeah. Re recourse is the type of promissory note that you're used to. Most notes are recourse. The borrower promises to pay the entire debt, period, no matter what, with all its costs, with all its charges, the entire debt according to the terms of the note. In a non-recourse note, the lender says it will accept the mortgaged property only as full payment and not go after the additional amounts if there is any additional amount. Borrowers love to sign notes that are non-recourse. Lenders says lend, means lenders going to take the property away from me, but that's it. You don't have to pay the whole amount, which again can get bigger, can get a lot bigger than the value of the property. Uh, lenders don't like to have those, but it's a as a uh, negotiable thing in the marketplace. Real strong borrowers can get away with non-recourse notes. Real weak borrowers can. Yes. Sir. How does that affect the uh, credit rating uh, on the borrower if if the the bank takes back the the credit rating. Yeah, the, when, the credit. If it was a credit. if it was a non-recourse note, the borrower hasn't done anything wrong. Okay. There is no negative impact. No negative impact. Okay, so we got a mortgage that secures the payment of a debt with the real estate, and we got the debt reflected by the promissory <coughs> note. Now, in Florida. It's very clear that a mortgage creates a lien against real estate only. The reason that's significant is because in a lot of other jurisdictions, a mortgage actually transfers title to the lender. We have a Florida statute that explicitly says that a mortgage does not transfer title, 
does not transfer possession. It merely creates a lien on real estate. So Florida is what's called a lien theory state. A lien what? Lien theory. Lien theory. There's there, there's uh, okay. Now <coughs> In a mortgage, you're going to have parties with names just like we do in other instruments, lessor, lessee, grantor, grantee. Well, we got mortgagor and mortgagee. Mortgagor is the property owner, that's the borrower. Mortgagee is the bank, it's the lender. Remarkably, the more progressive way of doing these documents now is borrower lender. Straightforward, let's say what we mean, who's the borrower, who's the lender, and not get hung up on these archaic mortgage or mortgagee terms, but you'll see them in documents. Um, <coughs> to get started into a mortgage transaction, with a bank, and that's the examples that we're always going to use in talking about a bank, initially. <clears throat> Borrower, of course, files a loan application. You know that. Just like you file an application for a car loan or an application for a credit card, well, you file a loan application with a lender to get a mortgage. The important term, though, is a loan commitment. When a bank approves your loan, it sends you a document called a loan commitment. And that loan commitment is a contract. And the bank expects you as the borrower to sign the loan commitment and agree to the terms. Now all the terms of the loan are going to be in there the maturity date, the interest rate, what are the payments going to be, who all is going to be required to sign, are there going to be personal guarantees, there are going to be other provisions in there that relate to that relate to the terms of the loan itself, but there are other provisions in there that relate to what's going to happen before closing. Is an commitment, is a appraisal going to be required, is a survey going to be required, is title, of, all of the, it, it, it's, it's a contract, just like a contract between a buyer and seller, that outlines what's going to happen between the time it's signed and the closing. A mortgage commitment, a loan commitment, mortgage commitment is exactly the same thing. It says, here's what's going to be done between now and closing. Here are the terms that are going to be set for. They're going to be set forth in your loan documents at closing. You negotiate that commitment just like you negotiate any other contract. You read it. If there are things in there you don't like, you haggle with the bank over. You make changes. You revise it. It's an instrument that gets either crossed out and changed and initialed or redrawn and redrafted, just like a sales contract. And it is a contract between the bank and the borrower, and it's called a loan commitment. When you accept the loan commitment, the bank is going to require you to pay a commitment fee. Often that's 1% of the loan. Sometimes it's less, sometimes it's more. What that commitment fee is all about is this. At the moment, the bank agrees to make the loan to you when the loan commitment is fully signed up. Banks are required this is a million dollar loan, they're required to set aside that million dollars. That becomes a liability to the bank that it is obligated to fund that million dollars to your commitment. At the time the bank sets aside that money, theoretically, it quits earning any return on it. <coughs> You're paying a commitment fee to the bank to compensate it for setting that money aside for you until the closing so that if you don't close, whether either 
you don't close because you just don't. Or whether something goes wrong and you don't qualify, whether the appraisal doesn't work out, whether the title's bad, the survey's bad, your credit probably isn't an issue because I've already checked out your credit. But all the things that could go wrong between now and a closing, well, that's tough. You're losing your commitment fee. You pay the commitment fee for the bank to set the money aside between now and closing, whether or not there is a closing. It's not a payment on the loan, it's not applied to the loan, it's a fee. You saw in the, uh, when we went through, there was a 1% commitment fee paid to the lender. That's at the time they signed the commitment. They're committing to make the loan, and because they've committed those funds to you, you're paying them a fee for it. Okay. Um, it's important to realize that there are some obligations and rights of the parties under a mortgage and we're going to discuss those at great length when we go through the loan document later. Uh, a couple of the material call to your attention is first is the concept of possession. You need to realize that under a mortgage, because we are a lien theory state and you still own the property and the bank just has a lien, you keep possession of the property. And I know you've assumed that, but the point is, in Florida, under our lien theory state, the borrower retains possession. The important part of that is that that makes the borrower, the owner, entitled to the rents. So during the term of the mortgage, the borrower continues to collect the rents. And of course, then he uses them to make the mortgage payments. It's kind of a given, but in some states, it doesn't work that way. In some states, the lender collects the rents and applies them to the mortgage payments, so if there are any left over, they give them back to you. It doesn't happen in Florida, but that does happen in Florida after you default. When you sign a mortgage, you agree that upon a default, you will turn over possession to the lender, but nobody does. But most importantly, you agree that the lender gets possession of your rents upon default. And that does happen. The lender comes in with a vengeance and has a receiver appointed to collect your rents and notify all the tenants to start paying the rents to directly to the lender. Even though you still own the property, and even though you're the landlord under those leases, and you're entitled to collect the rents, you pledge that right to collect the rents to the lender. And when you default, the lender comes in and starts collecting the rents from the tenant right up until the foreclosure is done. Okay. Um, what happens when yes. you redeem your property? If you get it back, what, what happens to that, that rent? If you what, I'm sorry? If you are able to get back your property uh, as an owner, uh, there's a foreclosure procedure, there's time in between there. The well, during a foreclosure, <clears throat> which we're going to talk about at length in a minute, the lender doesn't become the owner until the foreclosure is over. But they don't wait that long to collect the rents, is my point. When you've defaulted, they start collecting the rents even sooner, even though they're not the owner. Once they become the owner, of course they're entitled to the rents because they're the owner. But during a foreclosure, the lender's going to be in there collecting rents from your tenants. Now, <clears throat> do, they, do, they the the, do they keep the net on that or, or just keep as much as to pay, to pay the mortgage? So they keep the they continue to hold it all, and they don't hand any back to you, and it'll all get sorted out in the foreclosure, during in the foreclosure proceeding, if there is an overage. Trust me, if there were an overage, the guy wouldn't have defaulted. There isn't an overage. If there had been enough there to pay the loan, the guy would have collected the rents and paid the loan. So there's going to be a shortfall, unless there were some other problem. But normally, and, and so should that be the case, that's what happens as part of a foreclosure proceeding is an adjustment of all those debits and credits. Okay. <clears throat> the mortgage is going to require you, the borrower, to protect the security, to protect the property. And there are two important ways the loan is going to require you to protect the property, and we've talked about them over and over again, but this is where they get stuck forth in the mortgage. The first thing is, they're going to require you, as the owner, to pay the taxes. And we've talked about why. Taxes are the first 
lien priority period. They're even in front of mortgages. So lenders are going to require you to pay the taxes. And it's going to be a default under the mortgage if you don't. And lenders going to require you to keep all buildings on the property insured. And that's, of course, because the building is collateral for the loan. If it burns down, there needs to be insurance proceeds there to cover it. Otherwise, the lender's collateral is gone. So the lender wants you to insure it and wants you to pay for insurance. Now, those two items, taxes and insurance, are so important to a lender that they usually require you to pay them every month into escrow. Lender has an escrow account. In addition to your monthly payment of interest and principal, that's P&I, as you heard talked about, they require you to pay one-twelfth of a year's taxes and one-twelfth of a year's insurance. And that's TI. So P-I-T-I that you hear about all the time when people say, what are your mortgage payments? What are they P-I-T-I? Principal, interest, taxes, and insurance. And that's what your mortgage payment is going to be to a lender. Now, in big commercial mortgages with sophisticated borrowers, sometimes the lender does not require an escrow for taxes and insurance. In every residential loan they do. And you can opt out of it with some banks if you're a good customer, even on a residential loan. But you've got to send them a copy of a paid tax bill every year. You've got to send them a copy of your paid insurance premium every year. Otherwise, they collect these from you. And they don't then give you the money to go pay the taxes. They pay the taxes. And they don't give you the money to give to State Farm. They send it to State Farm. So they collect from you in advance 12 times, and then they pay the premium 12 times, then they pay the taxes. Monthly, 1 12th with each year payment. That's P-I-T-I. OK. Um, talk a little bit about priorities. Um, Priorities between mortgages and leases. It's a very simple rule for getting the concept of recording leases because we don't usually record them. Very simply, the day you sign and record that mortgage, all leases that were executed before that have priority over the mortgage. All leases that are executed after that are inferior to the mortgage. What that simply means is this. If the lender takes the property back from you in a foreclosure, it has to honor all of the leases that were entered into before the time of the loan. It does not have to honor leases that were entered into after the time of the mortgage, and the lender can kick those people off. So it's a simple before and after test. The materials now want to get into the question of priorities between mechanics, liens, and mortgages. And we're not going to go there. It is way too sophisticated. It is the source of way too much litigation. And know that for the most part, <coughs> mortgages have priorities over mechanics, liens. But there are exceptions. Sometimes a mechanics lien could be in front of a mortgage. There's no hard and fast rule. It's subject to a half a dozen different factors, and they're different in every state, and they're weird in Florida, and they're litigated all the time, and it's just really not worth going into. I want to talk about default for a minute. Default is when somebody doesn't do something they've promised to do. Under the promissory note, <clears throat> default is a failure to make a payment. In that promissory note, you promise to pay a monthly payment of principal and interest, or maybe a monthly payment of interest only. But you promise to make a payment every month. If you don't make a payment that you promised to make, <coughs> the loan goes into default. 
There are other ways you can default in the mortgage transaction. There are other things that you promise to do on a mortgage, separate from making the payments. Promise to pay the taxes. Promise to pay the insurance. Promise to keep the property in good repair. Promise not to sell it without the bank's consent. You promised all kinds of things. Anytime you made a promise in the note to make payments or in the mortgage to do something as it relates to the collateral, and you don't do it, that creates an event of default. Default triggers a concept called acceleration. And acceleration is hugely important. Here's what acceleration means. You promise to make a payment of $1,000 on the first day of every month. First day of January, first day of February, first day of March. If you don't make a payment, the bank has the right to declare the entire debt due in its entirety right now. That's called acceleration. Were it not for an acceleration clause, the bank would get to sue you on February 1st for $1,000. That's all. Then they'd have to sue you on March 1st for another $1,000. And sue you again on April 1st for another $1,000 for 25 years. That's pretty stupid. So the note as to monthly payments contains a provision that says if you fail to make any payment when it's due, the bank has the right to accelerate the whole balance and call the whole thing due right now. That's acceleration. It's hugely important. Yes, sir? I mean, if, if they can't make that one month payment or whatever it may be, what gives the bank the, you know, the, I shouldn't say the right, but the... Well, they're not. That, all right, let's just charge them the whole thing now. I mean, that's. Well, like there, there are there are exceptions to the concept that we'll talk about in a minute. But the point is, the concept is called acceleration. They have the right to accelerate. Whether they will or won't is a different issue. They'll be very happy to accept a five percent late charge from you and take the payment next month. They don't want to accelerate. They don't want to foreclose. They don't want your damn. They don't want your house. They don't want your payment. Yeah but they have the right to. And as you know, after three or four months of not making payments, then, then, then they know they're tired of waiting, and then they're going to accelerate, and then they're going to go. They have the right to do it immediately. 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 There, there are grace periods in all kinds of notes. Um, some day, sometimes five days, sometimes 10 days, some days 15 days. And then after that, certain late charges kick in. But they have the right, after the grace period, which is five or 10 days to accelerate the whole thing if they want to. In addition, realize that there are acceleration clauses in the mortgage also as to things you promised to do there. You didn't pay the taxes. That's not just, okay, fine, give me the $5,000 taxes. They have the right to call the whole loan off if they want to. They won't. They'll pay the taxes and add them to the balance but they have the right to. Same thing on insurance. They'll go out and buy a policy. It'll cost four or five times as much as what you could have gotten insured for. But they'll get it insured and they'll add that to the balance. Mm -hmm. But as all this stuff starts to snowball and you're missing a payment every now and then and you're not paying your taxes and you're not paying your insurance, pretty soon they say, we've had it with this guy. We're going to accelerate the loan and now we want the entire $1 million. Give it to me. And if you don't give me the whole million, then we're going to foreclose the loan. But acceleration is a very important concept, and it's the ability to call the whole loan due for failure to fulfill a promise, either of a monthly P&I payment under the note or of any other obligation under a mortgage. Okay. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the right of redemption, which is a little bit of what you were getting at. These are your rights to redeem the property before you lose it in foreclosure. The concept 
is that borrower has what the law calls an equity of redemption. And what that means is that the courts think it's not fair for you to lose your property strictly as a result of missing a few payments. That doesn't mean that you have the right to make those few payments. But what it does mean is that you absolutely have the right to pay off the loan before the bank forecloses and takes the property away from you. The, that concept is called equity of redemption. The actual statutory term for it is the statutory right of redemption. We have a statute in Florida, and every state has one, and they vary based on the time periods, of how long it is after, up until the bank forecloses, and even <laughs> after the conclusion of the foreclosure procedure, how long it is that you have the right to still come in and pay it off in full. Not to make, not to miss, not to make just a couple of payments that you miss. Or to say, gee, I'm sorry, I didn't pay the taxes, here's the taxes. This does not undo the bank's right of acceleration. They have accelerated, and they said, I want it all, and they're entitled to get it all. But this is your right to make them take the money and not conclude the foreclosure and take your property away. In Florida, that right exists for 10 days even after the foreclosure auction. We're going to talk about the procedure in a foreclosure and the auction and when the court auctions the property off. But even for 10 days after the buyer at an auction has bought the property and has paid the money into the registry of the court, you as the owner still have 10 more days to come in and pay everything. Now that means pay the principal, pay all the accrued interest, the court costs, the attorney's fees, the clerk's costs, all those costs, but the point is the court and the legislature are trying to protect your ability to keep you from losing the property for a very extended period even after the sale. But 10 days after that foreclosure sale, the clerk is going to give a deed to that buyer, and then you're done. That's the statutory right of redemption. Yes, sir? That's uh, the same for residential and commercial? Yes, sir. Yes, that has nothing to do with whether it's residential or commercial, either one. And the bank has the right not to accept back payments or the back the late payments? bank absolutely has the right not to accept the two or three payments you missed. That's okay. called a right to reinstate. Now. So, because you always hear about these big, I don't know, hedge funds buying out paper on the dog track or something, and they know that it's then going to go into foreclosure. Okay. Or late payment well, or whatever. And they're, they're no, what I'm saying is, but they're going to pay off the loan in full when they do it. They're not going to come in and try to catch up the three payments that the borrower missed because the bank doesn't have to take it anymore. When the bank has had it with a loan, it's, it's a formal action when the bank accelerates under the acceleration clause. It demands, okay, the whole loan is due now, you owe me the whole thing. From that point forward, the bank never again has to accept reinstatement. Okay. Reinstatement is when you make those few payments with a few late charges yeah. and, oh, I'm sorry, I'll try to be good now. No, getting back on track again. From the moment the bank accelerates, it never again can be forced to accept merely the missing payments or the missing taxes or the missing insurance. Once they call a loan due under the acceleration clause, they can never again be forced to accept payments. But what we're talking about under this right of redemption, you as the owner still have the right to pay the whole damn thing off before they take it away from you. That from the, from the moment of acceleration forward, then we're worried about right of redemption. Right of redemption is to keep from losing it, but it's not the right to come in and catch up on your late payments anymore. Okay. In those 10 days, then there's a set price for the property other than, than the initial debt to the bank. They, um, it, no, it is still the debt to the bank. <coughs> so you go to, to the judge and say, I'm going to pay the whole amount. And, and you go to the clerk, 
and you pay the entire amount to the clerk, the clerk that held the foreclosure, the judge. The clerk is holding the yeah. foreclosure sale on behalf of the judge. You get to pay the full debt, and then the mortgage goes away and you still own your property and it was not sold anymore. And what happens to all the legal fees? Then the bank can't... Well, no, those got to be paid too. The amount due the bank includes the attorney's fees and the court costs. And all of the clerk's costs and all that. The, the, the redemption amount, when I say you get to pay the amount that's due, you get to pay the big amount that's due. The principal, the interest, the court costs, the attorney's fees, the foreclosure costs, the advertising costs, all that stuff. There's no bargains. The only bargain is you can keep yourself from losing your property, and even though there's already been a sale. That small amount is that it's, it's, a, it's a public information in the, in the judge's office? Yeah, it, it, well, it, the final judgment in foreclosure is going to say what that amount is. It's going to, it's going to say. So what happens mechanically is remember somebody at a foreclosure sale bid some money and put it in the clerk's registry to buy that property. If the loan gets paid off, that purchaser gets his money back. And the property just isn't sold anymore. The, the purchaser at the auction. The auction purchaser will pay his money into the court registry. But the property is not going to be sold. Because you paid off the loan and you saved it. You kept it from going down. Okay. Um, now, we're going to talk about foreclosure. And we're going to talk about what happens. Um, But I want to explore a concept used in other states. It's not used in Florida, and we're going to talk about it briefly, only, only so you'll know it exists. Foreclosure is the procedure where, under a mortgage, the borrower has defaulted, the lender has accelerated, and it's now time for the lender to go after the property. So foreclosure is the procedure by which a lender tries to get the security, get the property, which is collateral, for the loan. Now, in lots of states, but not Florida, they have a procedure called non-judicial foreclosure. And believe it or not, and it sounds so foreign to me because of what I'm used to. The lender, the bank, gets to run an ad in the newspaper and say, Joe Blow didn't pay his loan, and I'm selling his property. Bring me some offers. And after a few weeks, uh, that lender simply issues a deed, even though he didn't own the property. The lender has the right to sign a deed to the buyer, and your house is sold. It's over. That's called non-judicial non -judicial foreclosure. There is no judicial proceeding. Simply, the lender has a right of sale, and he raises his hand and swears you didn't make your payments, and he advertises your property for sale, and he sells your property. End of story. You're out. Florida doesn't see it that way. He, yes? He still has to get approval from a judge for that or not? From the bank? That is the bank. No, does the bank have to get approval from the judge to be able to do there that? Is no, there is no court proceeding for that. It's non-judicial. They don't even file suit. So when you say he raises his hand to swear... I'm sorry? He does that like in the comfort of his office? The bank? Yeah. You said that they... What I'm saying is there is no lawsuit filed. It's non-judicial. Simply, when you sign a mortgage to a bank in those states, it says right in there, if you don't pay the bank, the bank has the right to hold a private sale of the property and to sign a deed to its buyer, <coughs> and you're out. No judge, no lawsuit, no foreclosure. But the buyer, if the homeowner or the owner has a problem with that, they it, can take it to court? He, he can file a suit to try it. to stop okay. it, exactly. But if he doesn't, the procedure goes forward without any lawsuit. He's going to get a notice. He's got a notice yeah. from the bank. We've accelerated your loan. Now we're selling your property, and we're deeding it to the buyer on Wednesday. And if you want to stop it, you have to go into court and file suit to set it aside. Otherwise, it's happened. Because, because in the loan documents, you gave them the right to do that. And in those states, that's enforceable, and it works. So even that does not work in Florida. Even though it's non-judicial, it probably always ends up in the court anyways. 
Well, maybe. If, if, if the borrower has the money to hire a lawyer to go file a lawsuit to try to stop it, yeah. He probably didn't have any money, he ain't making his loan payment. Well, he's saving all the money from the loan payment. <laughs> uh, there, are, there just have not been any. Um, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't happen very often. Usually the guy moves up. Usually they get the letter and go, oh, crap, pack their stuff and move, you know. Um, yes, ma'am? For that, they did have to be to the name of the bank, right? That the bank had to have the deed to sell the property. No. In those states, the terms of the mortgage give the bank the right to do that, to issue a deed. Georgia, right across the line. That's how it's done in Georgia. They don't have mortgage foreclosure lawsuits in Georgia. The bank sends you a letter and says you didn't make your payments, I've accelerated your loan, I'm selling your property next Wednesday. Get out. So you come, you either file suit to stop them, if you can afford a lawyer to file suit, or you come running in there with the money. Okay, that's non-judicial foreclosure. We don't do that in Florida, but they do it in a lot of states. What we do do in Florida is judicial foreclosure. And I'm going to show you how that works in just a minute. And I'm going to draw a diagram on the board to show you timing-wise and how all this stuff works. But what that means is for a lender to take your property in Florida, he has to file a lawsuit in the circuit court. Period. Florida law clearly states any mortgage has to be foreclosed in a court proceeding in order for the lender to have the property sold to satisfy the debt. You can't just take it and sell it. Now, um, Let me see if I can draw you a diagram of a set of facts, if I can get one of these things to write, and, and how this kind of stuff would happen. Yeah, that's a good one. All right. Let's say in, uh, in the year 2000 here, you bought this piece of property. You own it. At the same time, in the year 2000, you gave a first mortgage to a bank for, let's say you bought the property for $200,000 and you, you borrowed $100,000 from the bank as a first mortgage at the time of the closing. Um, Let's say a few, uh, a few months after you've owned the property, some neighbor comes to see you and says, I need an easement over 10 feet of your property. Could you give me an easement over 10 feet of your property here? And you say, sure. So let's say in, ah, let's say that's a year later. In 2001, You give an easement over 10 feet of the property, and all these things are getting recorded. So you bought it in 2000, you borrowed 100,000, you're making your payments, things are going okay. Neighbor says, would you give me an easement over 10 feet of the property? And yeah, and so you record his easement in 2001. 2002, things aren't going so well for you. So in 2002, you need some more money, you go out and get a second mortgage. You get a second mortgage and you borrow another $100,000. So now you've got $200,000 of debt. The property is worth $200,000. And things aren't going well and that's why you went out and borrowed this additional money. And one of the reasons it wasn't going well was because you weren't paying IRS on your withholding taxes from your employees, and IRS <coughs> files a lien in 2003 
for $50,000. And then you get sued. A couple of creditors file judgments against you. And you get a bunch of judgments recorded in 2004. Now, you got all these claims against your piece of property here. Let's say because you're trying to hold on to the property, you keep making your payments on this first mortgage. So it's current, it's fine, they're not mad at you, nothing's gone wrong yet, you own it, you're paying them. <coughs> but you quit paying this loan. You can't afford the payments on this loan anymore, so this one's going into default. This lender accelerates the balance, says he doesn't want the thousand dollars a month anymore, he wants his whole hundred thousand dollars, he's going to file a foreclosure. He's going to want the court to sell the property in order to get him his hundred thousand dollars back. So, here's what happens. This lender, he files a complaint. That begins his lawsuit. He files a complaint with the court. That begins the foreclosure proceeding. He wants to clean the title up as best he can so the property can be sold. So the first person he names in the complaint is you, because you're the owner and he wants to sell your property and take it away from you. So the first person that he sues is the owner. In addition, he'd sure like to get this IRS lien off here. Well, IRS recorded after he did. IRS is inferior to that lien. So he names IRS as a defendant. That's going to wipe them out. And these three guys that got judgments against you, A, B, and C, he names them as defendants in the foreclosure too. And he says, Your Honor, I have a second mortgage. I want to take it away from the owner so we can sell it. I want you to wipe out IRS because they're inferior to me. I want you to wipe out these three judgment holders and give me the ability to sell the property. Now realize what's happening. He's going to file a list pendants. We talked about a list pendants. That's a notice in the public records that a foreclosure suit is going on so that anybody who files after him uh, is going to be wiped out, just like these guys are being wiped out, but anybody else who filed out here too, later, they're going to be wiped out too because of this list pendants that he filed right now. So he's trying to clean up the title. The parties that he can clean up are anybody who recorded after him, IRS and A, B, and C creditors. But that lender cannot wipe out anybody who was recorded before him. That first mortgage is staying on there. When this property is sold as a result of this foreclosure, it's going to wipe out this guy, and it's going to wipe out these guys, and it's going to wipe out anybody else who files. And of course it's going to eliminate this mortgage because it's being sold. But and it's going to eliminate the rights of the owner because he signed the mortgage, but the mortgage is still on there. So, at the end of this lawsuit, each of these parties has the right to come in and scream and yell and say, but your honor, this isn't fair, and that it is fair. And they lose, and they're going to get wiped out, and at the end of this foreclosure, there's going to be an auction. But first, excuse me, there's going to be a final judgment first. And the final judgment, the judge is going to say the total amount due. He's going to say the total amount due is $111,000. Because that includes principal and late charges, interest, attorney's fees, foreclosure costs. He says $111,000 is due in that final judgment. And the judge also says let's have an auction. And he says we're going to set the auction for four weeks out. We're going to have an auction where people are going to bid on the property. 
remember, if they're paying attention, even if the property is still worth $200,000, they're sure as hell not going to bid $200,000 because when they get it, there's a $100,000 mortgage on there. So at a minimum, they're getting it subject to a $100,000 mortgage. If the judge says in four weeks, let's have an auction, and then he has an auction, and there was a buyer at the auction, and the buyer bids a certain amount of money and pays that money into the court registry, and for 10 days after this auction, the owner has the right to come in and pay this $111,000 and the whole thing goes away, and everything's back where it was. Now, if he does that, IRS is still on there. These judgment creditors are still on there. They didn't get wiped out. But if you conclude the foreclosure and the foreclosure goes all the way through, it wipes out everybody after the mortgage. Realize that if the first loan were in default, let's take this one step further. Let's say he quit paying this guy. Now this guy's filing a foreclosure. He wants his $100,000, but he gets to name the holder of the second mortgage and wipe him out. And he wipes out all these other guys too. So if this guy has a foreclosure auction, people are getting the title free and clear all cleaned up, wiping out everybody. Remember, they don't wipe out real estate taxes, so you've got to pay some attention to that because real estate taxes are always on there. This lender can't wipe, nobody can wipe out real estate taxes in a foreclosure, they're always on there. But the point is, that's why a lender wants a first mortgage. The lender wants to be in first position so that no matter what else goes wrong, all throughout the rest of the history of the property until a foreclosure, whoever it is, they can wipe them all out, clean them all up, sell a property free and clear. This guy knew he was getting in second position when he got on there. And he knew that if he foreclosed, and if he sold it, or if he bought it in the foreclosure sale, because sometimes the lender ends up buying the property in a foreclosure sale. If nobody else bids, the lender gets the property. He knew he still had this on here. So anybody who takes the property from the foreclosure sale of this mortgage takes it with this debt on here, and still owes whatever these payments are here but the property has $100,000 less equity. That's basically the way priorities work in a mortgage foreclosure. One interesting thing I want to call your attention to. What about this guy with this easement out here? He doesn't know you were. Well, he was in front of this mortgage. They, this guy examined the title, saw this guy had a recorded easement, knew that when he foreclosed, he wasn't going to be able to wipe out the easement. The easement's still on there. However, what if this guy foreclosed? This guy would name the holder of the easement and wipe him out too. All of these things take priority from whenever they're recorded. You start with whoever you're foreclosing, whatever interest you're foreclosing, and you wipe out everybody after that. You can't wipe out anybody in front of that except one guy, the owner. The reason you can wipe him out is because he signed your mortgage. This guy didn't sign the mortgage. This guy didn't sign this mortgage, and therefore this guy can't wipe him out. If, at the time of the closing, this lender had said, you know, I don't like this easement. And the only way I'm giving you this mortgage is if you bring this easement guy in here and you have him sign the loan too that says that we can wipe him out. But other than that, he's in front of this mortgage, you can't wipe him out, uh, but he's behind this mortgage, and this lender could wipe him out. Yes, sir? At what point can you say, assuming all these time frames, can you file for bankruptcy saying that things are going bad and you want to stop all this? Okay. At, at any time... Does it supersede all of that? Well... It stops it. It stops it temporarily. It does not keep it from happening at all, by any means. So they say go back, reorganize, if you can't do it, it restarts again? Possibly. In, in some types of reorganization proceedings, when, when the owner 
owner is the only one that could be filing the bankruptcy. Right. When all this stuff hits the fan, the owner can go into the bankruptcy court and say, Your Honor, I want to file bankruptcy. The moment a bankruptcy is filed, that enters uh, the court enters what's called a stay order, S-T-A-Y. And that means stay put. And that says to everybody here who's proceeding against him, see, these guys might be suing him. They, these guys have already sued him and got judgment. <coughs> yeah. IRS might be trying to levy on his bank accounts. It says to anybody who's trying to take collection action against the guy who's filed bankruptcy, stop until the bankruptcy is finished. Because that's a federal matter. I'm sorry? Isn't that a federal matter? Well, it's a federal matter, and they're allowed to tell everybody to stop. But what they can't do, they can't wipe out a mortgage. They can't say, okay, fine, you're off because it's not fair because this guy has too much debt. Well, th that's the difference in being a secured creditor and having a mortgage. Right. They can't, bankruptcy court can <clears throat> wipe out these. Bankruptcy court can get judgment creditors off your back and say, your judgment's no good, it's not enforceable, he's discharged in bankruptcy, he doesn't have to pay those. But as to the piece of collateral, as to this piece of collateral that has these mortgages on there, bankruptcy cannot wipe out mortgages. They can require the letter to come in and reform it and rewrite it right. and maybe, re maybe restructure it exactly and make it easier for the guy. But ultimately, if they don't get paid, either as originally drafted or as restructured in the bankruptcy, they will still get the right to foreclose. But bankruptcy does shut them down for a while. What happens is, right after the suit gets filed, usually the owner runs in and talks to his bankruptcy lawyer. Mm -hmm. He waits all the way until the day before this auction. <laughs> the auction has been published in the newspaper for three weeks. It says it's going to be an auction. The day before this, he goes in and files bankruptcy. The bankruptcy order brings all this stuff to a halt. Kills the sale, stops everybody, <clears throat> waits three or four months. Ultimately, whoever's foreclosing has a right to come back into the judge and say, Judge, would you set a new sale? We'll still go ahead and do it. it it'll happen, but it'll get it'll get delayed significantly. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, two questions. One is, I mean, <clears throat> probably a dumb question, but if you pay off your first, uh -huh. your second becomes a first. Yep. But if you refinance your first, it's still a first. No. Maybe. Maybe depends on how it's done. <laughs> I mean, if you now to the same bank, I'm saying you go to. A different bank. You go to a different bank, it's conceivable that if you go to a different bank, this mortgage will be assigned to a different bank and restructured, and they can assume, your, assume the position. But you can't satisfy this loan and go out and get a new loan that should be recorded out here in 2005. You record a new loan out here in 2005? you got to take care of everybody else in between here. Everybody. That's the only way you can do it. You can possibly go to a bank and have this mortgage assigned and have them pick up this priority. But they're going to take a look at the title and nobody's going to do it. Once you've got this big a mess, nobody's going to do it anyway. Practically, that's not going to happen. Theoretically, it's possible. But no bank is going to take a look at this and say, God, this guy's got a hell of a mess. He's got a second in foreclosure. You got IRS. You got all these guys after him, and there's been a foreclosure. <coughs> Let's get on board. <laughs> Let's stay away from this one. You know, be happy this lender holds it, but don't put me in those shoes. Did you have a second question, or was that a part of the second? No, that was okay. Um, the concept to learn from all this is that. This is all about the recording priority that we talked about in the prior chapter, about recording. Stuff that's recorded in front of you, there's really kind of nothing you can do anything about. It's there. You learn to deal with it. You offset whatever you do by $100,000. It's there. Whatever comes after you, maybe you can clean it up. IRS. IRS can hold. You remember we talked about IRS can have an auction. Maybe while all this is going on, IRS decides to have an auction. And they sell. Well, that's nice. These two mortgages are on there. There's 200,000 in debt in front of IRS. And that easement is on there. 
The scary thing is, IRS doesn't do a foreclosure procedure. These guys are probably on there too, even though they're after it. Because they didn't do a foreclosure procedure, everything that's on there up until the time that IRS needs it is all still on there. IRS will tell you, oh, no, 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 we're prime, we take care of everybody. They don't. Because they don't hold a foreclosure procedure. They don't have a judge declaring. See, what happens in this final judgment is the judge declares IRS's lien will be void upon the sale. These guys' lien will be void upon the sale. So if the sale takes place, that kills these guys. It does not mean that this guy no longer owes IRS $50,000. It simply means IRS no longer has a lien on this piece of property. It, it differs from bankruptcy. It doesn't discharge debts. All we're talking about is cleaning up the title of this one piece of property here. And these judgments, we talked about there's three other judgments against this guy, and this guy owes other pieces of property. Well, he still owes those judgments, and those judgments are still liens on other pieces of property. But on this piece, which was foreclosed, they're getting wiped off. Yes, sir? And a mechanics lien, would that go away with, with the property? If, or if there were a recorded mechanics lien out here somewhere, the mechanics the lien or would be named as a defendant. He would be named as a defendant in the case, and he would be wiped out. Yes. If he, was, if he recorded after this. If he recorded in here. No, no, he's with those other guys. Those three which guys? guys? Back here? Yeah. Further, yeah, further out you go, the worse off you are. If he's, if he's here, he's OK. If he's here, he's gone. If he's here, he's gone. They all get wiped out because, and here's, here's the only, the only people who do get wiped out though are the people that are named in this complaint when this lender files. This lender does a title exam and goes out here and sees who's all here. And he needs to do that in order to clear the title of all those other claims. And the way he does it is he names them in the lawsuit. So he would name the mechanic, he'd name the mechanics lien guy in here. He'd say, and there's a guy with a mechanics lien. He's inferior to me, you're on to wipe him out too. And the judge will wipe him out. Because he was recorded after the mortgage. But if he was recorded here, he wouldn't even name it. Because he has no ability to wipe him out. Now, fortunately, mechanics lien expires in a year anyway, and it's gonna be gone, you know. So it's probably already expired. If it was recorded here before 2002, we're not real worried about it in 2004. It's already expired anyway. Because it's only good for a year. But if, if it were still valid, if it were still valid, when this lender foreclosed in 2004, he would name him in the complaint, and the court judgment would wipe him out so that when we had the auction, it would be free of his rights. Just like, oh. Yes, sir. Yeah, go yeah, for it. No. He raised his hand. I don't want to be rude. No, as far as, but the mechanics lien is attached to the property, not to the individual? The mechanics lien is attached to the property. And not the individual? Yeah. Yes, a mechanics, um, yeah. A mechanics lien is merely a lien on a piece of property that can get wiped out or enforced. It doesn't mean the guy does or does not owe you the money. Under mechanics lien, it's based on a contract and based on an obligation to pay. Mechanics lien is merely a way to try to get it paid by enforcing it against real estate. It, oh, and he, as we talked about here, even if a mechanics lien is only good for a year, the claim on the contract might be good for four years. But all we're worried about here is how long is there a claim against the title of this piece of property? So when, when I say to you, these things get wiped out. That's the point I was trying to make. They get wiped out as liens against this piece of real estate. They don't get wiped out as legitimate debts of this guy. He's still got all those problems. He's still got IRS problems. He's still got problems with all these creditors. He's still got problems with this mechanics lien contract. But they've all been wiped off of this piece of property so the piece of property can be sold free and clear in an auction so that a buyer gets it without those claims. And that's, once again, why the, being in first mortgage position is so damn important. And we'd say you can't, you can't wipe out anybody in front of you except one guy. That one guy is the owner. But the owner signed your mortgage. That's the reason you can sue him and take it away from him. But anybody 
between him and the time that your claim arises, you can't wipe them out. They're in front of you. They're after you, you can't. And that's the concept of not only mortgage foreclosures, but also the recording priorities we talked about. That's why it's important when you get in line. And it's when you record it, and that's what your priorities are. And sometimes there's three or four mortgages against your property. Sometimes there's a third and a fourth and a fifth. And a home equity loan. And, and they all get in line based upon when they record. And like you said, this is the second. But if by some fluke this guy pays off this, whoa, happy day, I'm first now. Uh, or these two get paid off, all of a sudden the first lien could be IRS. The people in front of you can go away, but you can't make them go away. You as a junior claimant can't make them go away and enforcing your rights. But it's wonderful if he decides to pay them off. Or if by law they expire because they're only good for a year. That gets them out of the way as a claim against the title. Yes, sir. The question I had was, um, was regarding the IRS's ability to auction the property. Uh -huh. In that particular case, they don't wipe anybody out. They, and when you purchase that, you, you're still <coughs> accountable for all these links, even the ones yes. behind the IRS? Yes, yes. Okay. And that's why people who are buying from IRS need to be so damn careful Excuse me, that they've examined the title and not just feel like, oh, geez, the government's selling it to me. It must be wonderful. All those claims are out there against that piece of property, and IRS will take anybody's money that will pay for a deed. IRS is glad to give you a quick claim deed to your house, to my house. They don't care, as long as they get some money for it. Hmm. And they don't care if there are a dozen other claims against it. So there's a possibility that you can buy a, a house from the IRS or something from the IRS, and then it gets foreclosed from it, some other lien holder? Absolutely, and taken away from you. You don't necessarily get clean title, and, and, even, and what people don't realize, when they go to a foreclosure auction in the courthouse, and there's an auction of bank number two here is selling, it doesn't say, hey, by the way, we're bank number two and there's a first mortgage on there. They don't say squat. They say, we're having an auction, and we're selling this piece of property, please come bid. And if you don't examine the title and find out that there's a $100,000 mortgage on there, then you're going to overpay by $100,000, because it's on there, and you're stuck with it one way or another. Uh, had, had a young friend, um, son of a friend, call me and say that a, a condominium association was foreclosing a lien for a guy not paying his condo assessments. And he was going to get to buy this townhouse over off a of Cordova Road here by the Lolo Yacht Club, $400,000 townhouse for only $3,000. So he said, great, man. You know, the debt's $3,000. He went and he, he, he bent in the foreclosure auction and he put down a deposit. And he said, now what about all those other mortgages? And I said, they're still on there. And he said, well, that's fraud, right? How can they advertise to me that they're selling this property and all this due is $3,000? They didn't tell you you were getting good title. They didn't tell you they were wiping everybody else out. They merely told you that whatever interest they have in the property, there's going to be a court sale based upon whatever interest they have in the property and based upon whoever they decided to wipe out. But in that case, where there were two mortgages on the property, in, in my case, there were a first and a second mortgage, it would be like one of these guys with a claim of lien. Having a sale here and having an auction based on his claim of lien, or based on whatever lien claim he had, the condo association's claim of lien, they don't come in and say, by the way, there are two mortgages on there too, but there are. They, they may be foreclosing too, but he had a sale first. He got there first. And then next week, these guys will have a sale and we'll take it away from them. And then these guys will have a sale. No, I'm sorry. This guy will have a sale and take it away from this guy. And then this guy would have a sale and take it away from all these guys. But you don't theoretically have to pay them. You just have the, the potential that you'll lose your house or the item that you bought when these foreclosures happen. You will have to pay them or else they'll be foreclosing. On you or just the property? On you, you own it now. On, on you but and you the property. You didn't, on you you didn't and buy the, the mortgage. You didn't assume the mortgage. No, you're, not, you're not personally liable for the debt, but you're the owner. They all, any foreclosure, they have to name the owner. Mm -hmm. Because you can't have a court auction unless you're taking the property away from the owner. Mm -hmm. So you always name the owner. Okay. And in that 
condo association lien case, the owner is responsible for those liens as the owner of the property. Just as the owner, he was responsible for these payments and these payments and this lien and these judgments. As the owner, he's responsible and therefore any of these people who have a lien claim have the right to file a suit and name the owner because he's responsible to them. And then it's just a question of who else do they get to wipe out as part of it. So when you buy something like that, you buy it subject to everything so that's Everything that could be out there. And, 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 and it's, it's, it's scary business. People think if they're having an auction in the courthouse, it must be a nice, clear, clean, wonderful, marketable title. It may be. It may be a very clean, marketable title from here forward. But not necessarily things out here. Not necessarily getting rid of this easement. Not necessarily getting rid of this mortgage. And as we talked about, constructive notice. You are constructively on notice of everything in the public records. Whether you went and looked at it or not, you're deemed to know it. That's why short sale is a somewhat of a better <coughs> option for some. Short sale, we're going to talk about that in two seconds. Yeah. As I said, we're going to do something in a minute called alternatives to foreclosure. We're going to talk that through. Okay. Um, <laughs> That's what happens in a foreclosure. Um, forgive me, I have to look and see for a minute how we're doing on time. We're doing better. Um, okay. Um, let's talk about what the materials talk about as two alternatives to foreclosure. They are a deed in lieu of foreclosure and a short sale. Now these are two things that can happen if the borrower and the lender want to cooperate and avoid all this lawsuit stuff, which is time consuming and expensive for everybody. A deed in lieu of foreclosure could only happen in our case here, if none of this stuff existed. A deed in lieu of foreclosure is where the owner, in lieu of foreclosure, instead of foreclosure, simply deeds the property back to the lender. Okay, when's that going to happen? Well, if it happened here in the year 2000, that's a great idea. That's all wonderful. The lender's glad to have the property. Borrower's glad to be out from under the debt. Title's nice and clean. Borrower can give a deed to the lender. That's a deed in lieu of foreclosure. However, if it happened out here in the year 2005, <coughs> Well, lenders getting a deed in 2005. What about all this crap? It's all on there. So a deed in lieu of foreclosure can only happen if the title is clear. In a deed in lieu of foreclosure, borrower deeds it back to the lender. Lender agrees, okay, I won't proceed after you for the balance on my debt. In this case, it probably wouldn't be much balance doing the debt. So lender agrees, I'll take a deed in lieu of foreclosing, and that will eliminate all your obligations to me. And that could, again, that could happen in the year 2000. It could even happen in the year 2001, but if it did, that easement would still be on there. Once you get to about here, it ain't ever going to happen anymore. This lender is not going to take a deed here with this mortgage on it. So, deed in lieu of foreclosure is a wonderful remedy, but only a title is clear. And the reason it doesn't happen very often is because the reason you're not making your payments is because you got all kinds of other damn problems. So, to think about it happening way out here, all this stuff is there. It's not getting cleaned up. That lender is not going to take a deed and have a mortgage and an IRS lien and three judgments on there and a can explain and an easement and all that stuff. Okay, so that's one alternative to foreclosures that need low foreclosure. 
The other one is a short sale. And you hear a lot about short sales today. Short sales, frankly, <coughs> although people don't talk about it, really can't happen either unless title is pretty clear. Because there's not enough money around to pay all these things off and clear them up. A short sale is simply this. You own a piece of property, you've got a mortgage on there for $250,000. Unfortunately, the property is only worth $200,000. Now, as a lender thinks about this, if the lender forecloses and gets it back, it's still only worth $200,000. So there's no great, wonderful solution for the lender to foreclose and get your house. It's still only going to get $200,000 for it. After all the costs of the foreclosure, after holding it for a while, after fixing it up, after finding a buyer, it's not a great idea. So what if you can find a buyer who's willing to pay $205,000? Wouldn't it make sense for the lender to say, okay, we'll agree. We'll let you sell the house for 205. We get the whole 205, of course. We eat 45, but at least we get 205 and we get it now. That's a short sale. A short sale is where the borrower and the lender agree that property is going to be sold for less than the balance due on the debt. And the lender agrees to accept that amount in full payment of the debt. But remember, if all this other crud is on the title, it ain't going to work. If there's a second mortgage on there for another hundred thousand, well, the property is still only worth two hundred. This lender's not going to agree to take zero. He's going to want to fight for a piece of it. If you've got two lenders fighting over a short sale, you might as well just go ahead and shoot yourself. Yeah. Um, it's not going to happen. Both of them are going to be pigs. Both of them are going to say, I'd like all my money and you take the hit. Now this guy has got some strength saying that. He's in first position. He can foreclose. This guy did not have anything anyway. But you'll screw up your sale. So similarly, how does he screw up his sale? Because he won't satisfy his mortgage. He's, he's staying on there. He said, knock yourself out. Go ahead. But I still got, I've got a whole $100,000 loan on there. This, remember that a buyer, a buyer at, the, at this time is only going to get his deed out here. And that mortgage is already on there. So unless he agrees to, to take a lesser amount and satisfy, it's just not going to work. Um, and, and even worse with all these guys. You can never go negotiate with all these guys. You can never say to this guy who has a $10,000 judgment, you're in sixth position. You're going to get zero. How would you like to have 50 cents? If he's smart, he'll take the 50 cents. But he won't. He's pissed. He sued this guy and got a judgment against him for 10 grand. And he wants every penny of it. So he's not going to agree. He wants this guy to take the hit. And, you know, it's just getting, uh, getting two people to agree, homeowner and one lender, is plenty tough. Getting Another party, and remember in all this, you've got to have a buyer who's willing to sit out here and wait three months to see whether these two can agree to see whether you can do a deal. Yeah. But if you, this guy's got to do a deal too, it's just not going to happen. Okay, those are alternatives to foreclosure. I want to roar through concepts in the rest of this chapter, which are different kinds of mortgages, just so you'll be familiar with what they are. I'd like to take a look for a couple of minutes at with, with two or three concepts that are important that I'm going to talk about. I want to quickly jump to the last chapter and then take a look at our mortgage forms if we have any time and then we're going to go to the exam. Um, the materials talk about a lot of different kinds of mortgages. I want you to just know what these things mean 
so you hear about them in conversation. I'm going to tell you now these are not on the exam. So just listen for a minute. Darn it. There's a purchase money mortgage. A purchase money mortgage is a mortgage that the seller holds. It's seller paper. It's when the buyer signs a mortgage back to the seller for a portion of the purchase price. Okay? Seller is the lender. That's a purchase money mortgage. We've talked about construction mortgages. Construction mortgages are where you borrow money to build a building. They're in draws. The lender gives you a construction loan and agrees for monies to be drawn on the balance of the loan as the building goes up. There are open-end mortgages. Open-end mortgages are mortgages that start small and get bigger. A home equity line of credit is an open-end mortgage. When you sign up a home equity line of credit with a lender, there is no debt. He gives you a checkbook. You write checks. As you write checks and they pay them, your balance grows. It's a mortgage. It's a home equity line of credit, it, it's a, it, but it starts out at zero. It's an open-ended mortgage that's going to get bigger later. Um, the materials talk about a bunch of different types of mortgages. Most of these are not worth going into. A fixed rate mortgage, everybody knows what that is. The rate stays the same. And adjustable rate mortgages, everybody knows what that is. The rate adjusts. It may adjust monthly and yearly, uh, but the rate changes. Yes, sir? Uh, I hate to stop you. I had a quick question on uh, purchase money. Yeah, interest uh, rates? No, uh, purchase money. Purchase money mortgage, sure. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, in that scenario, let's say it's owner finance, uh, does the borrower get the deed? Yeah, case? yeah, yeah. Under purchase money mortgage, seller gives the deed to the buyer, uh -huh. buyer signs a note mortgage back to the seller. You record them both. Oh, buyer owns them. Okay. Okay, yeah, that's a real closing. It's just that instead of a third party lender out there giving money, yeah. the buyer signs a note mortgage back to the seller. And you record the note. Yeah, yeah you record the mortgage. Yeah, you, you record the mortgage. Tax on that? I'm, I'm sorry? You pay intangible tax? Intangible tax on the recording of that mortgage? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Just like any mortgage. It's a recorded mortgage. It's a real mortgage. It's a real mortgage and just no third party lender involved. Okay, the so seller so is both the seller and the lender. And the lender. Yep. So they're still protected by being in the first lien position? If, if, if it, yes, if it's first. If, if it's it is first. Property. Or second or third. Exactly. You, you're you, you got a recorded mortgage the same as anybody else. If you're first, you're first. If you're second, you're second. But the point is, you're just as protected as a bank would be. Okay. But you're the seller. You got, normally you get some of your money and you get paper for the rest. Right. You get enough mortgage for the rest. Okay. All right. There are a bunch of different types of mortgages they talk about. I want you to be familiar with a balloon mortgage because it's important in Florida. Florida has a balloon mortgage statute. A balloon mortgage is where you have a final big fat huge payment at the back end. You make regular payments for a while and then the whole thing comes due. But not like we talked about accelerating because you defaulted. This is built into the loan right from the start. So you say I'm going to make payments of da 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 da, -da for a certain period and then there's going to be a balloon payment three years later of everything that's due. The important thing about that in Florida is if you have a balloon mortgage in Florida, you have to put all kinds of certain language in it and boldface type. And if you don't, the balloon is unenforceable. So just be aware of that. If you're going to do a balloon mortgage, you need to take a look at the statute and follow it. There are reverse mortgages. You see these on TV? Everybody know what a reverse mortgage is? Yes. Yeah. Anybody? Yes? Yeah? No? Oh, my, yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry? Have to pull your equity back out. Of yeah, door. monthly, monthly. Here's how it works. Old people don't have a mortgage on their house. They don't have any money to make payments. So they sign a reverse mortgage. What's making it reverse is this. Normally, you sign a mortgage, you make payments to the lender every month. On a reverse mortgage, you sign a reverse mortgage, Lender makes payments to you every month. You and your balance gets bigger. But there are never any payments. On a reverse mortgage, the lender sends a check to the borrower every month. The balance gets bigger and bigger and bigger. When they die, it's due. That's what you're seeing advertised on TV in these reverse mortgages. Reverse is reverse from normal. Lender pays the owner every month rather than owner pays the lender every month. Yes? Question as it relates to that. 
what happens if you die like two years into it and there's a lot still left? Right. Does that transfer to, let's no, say you had a will? No, there isn't any left. It comes due when you die. It comes due when you die on a reverse mortgage. And the estate pays that. I'm sorry? The estate pays that balance. No, does the balance go to the estate is what I'm trying to ask. Like, let's say the you only got can, two The years estate can pay it off if you wanted to. The estate wanted to pay off the remainder of the debt, then they still own the property. Otherwise, the lender's going to foreclose and take the property. Okay. Whatever the balance is at the time of death, there are not going to be any more checks issued, okay? And there's going to be a certain amount due. Two, okay. two years later. Two years later, the lender has issued 24 monthly checks to the borrower. The debt is now $24,000. So the estate can either pay $24,000 and the loan goes away, or the lender forecloses and takes the house. Gotcha. But the old folks are dead and the kids don't care, so they let it go. Maybe. But if it's worth $200,000, they're going to find the money to pay it off. Um, okay. You need to know about a couple of laws that affect mortgages. And the first one is usury. And you need to know what usury is. Excuse me. Usury is charging interest in excess of the lawful rate. This is really bad. Because it has criminal penalties attached to it. This is loan sharking. But you need to know what usury laws are because they're going to be usury provisions in every note and mortgage. Talking about what if this loan is usurious. In Florida, usury rate is 18%. Interest in Florida may not be charged at more than 18%, except, there are all kinds of little exceptions, except for pawn shops, except for credit cards, except for this, da, 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 da. Basically, though, when you're dealing in mortgages, the maximum interest rate is 18% until you get to a half a million dollars. At a half a million dollars, the interest rate max becomes 25%. After 25%, it's criminal loan sharking, and there are criminal penalties. Now, if you charge usury in excess of 18%, you forfeit all your interest. All your interest. You make a loan to somebody at 19% interest, he goes into court and has the court declare, you've committed usury, and he never has to pay you any interest for the life of the loan. Zero. That's pretty bad. But once you get over 25%, then it's crime. And it's a felony, then you go to jail, the lender goes to jail, that's loan sharking. But the term is usury, and you're going to see provisions in every note saying this is not usury. No matter what it says, this is not usury. And same thing in a mortgage. That's white collar jail, though, right? I'm sorry? It's white collar jail. Which county jail? White. The nice white county jail? <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I, don't know what the, I don't know what I don't know what the penalties are. It's different states. They have, they have there's a certain penalty for 25 to 45 percent. Then there's another penalty for 45 on up. You know, so they they go up in stages. And, you know, but no, no, nobody's demonstrating for this, so nobody seems to care about this one. Okay, you need to know about the Federal Truth in Lending Law and Reg Z. And Reg Z is what gave us the famous APR that you see everywhere. And all that is is the federal way of saying that the APR is not only the interest on the loan, but it's all the closing costs spread over the life of the loan. Um, there are two or three other laws that affect lending. They're not worth going into. I'm not going to mention them. We're going to skip them all. I want to talk about I want to talk about what happens if property is sold while it's subject to a mortgage. There is a very important clause in every mortgage loan today called a due on sale clause. Hugely important. It says in a dozen different ways, if you the borrower sell this property without paying me off, the buyer cannot automatically just pick up your payments and go. The loan is due in full. Every loan says that today. They used to say it back in the 60s and 70s, and the courts wouldn't enforce it. 
starting in early 80s, they're enforceable now, very enforceable in Florida. Every mortgage you're going to see has a due on sale clause. Now, they still might let a buyer take over the payments, but you got to ask. And you got to beg. And you got to give them financials on the buyers, and you got to pay an assumption fee. They might be transferable. The loan might be transferable. But if you don't ask and if you don't get the lender's consent, the loan is due on sale. That's a due on sale clause. It means just what it says, but it's a long clause about this big. And it doesn't just say due on sale, it says due on all kinds of things. Due if you get a second mortgage. Due if you have a judgment entered against you. They pile all that stuff in together in a clause that says it's due if you sell. Um, okay, now, I have wanted to review our mortgage forms. It may be that we're going to run out of time for that because we have to go quickly through Chapter 22 because there are two questions on the exam from Chapter 22, so I, I think you may want to hear a couple of quickies here. You want to just go ahead and uh, give us the exact information? Just go ahead and tell you exactly what they are? Yeah, yeah. 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 You'll hear. So heavy. Just just you're only going to talk for 10 minutes. You'll hear. All right. Chapter 22 is another way of financing real estate. It's called the installment sale contract or the land installment contract or what we call them here in Florida, the contract for deed or the agreement for deed. You probably heard of them most likely as a contract for deed. And let me tell you what it is. It is along the lines of what Frederick asked about before. It is seller financing. There are two ways that the seller can finance property. One is in our traditional way that we've talked about before and we talked about a minute ago. Seller and buyer sign a contract. This is the old way, the traditional way. This is not a contract for deed we're going to talk about in a minute. Buyer will pay some money to the seller and if you don't bring in a third party lender for the rest of the money, buyer will execute a purchase money mortgage back to the seller. There'll be a note. There'll be a mortgage called a purchase money mortgage. Seller will at the closing deed the property to a buyer. So this is just like any of our other deals and just like our other diagram but we're going to cut out that third party lender. Seller deeds the property to a buyer, buyer pays back some of the money, and for the rest, he signs a purchase money mortgage and note. You know, $50,000 deal. Buyer pays him $10,000 in cash and signs a purchase money mortgage for $40,000. Okay, but the important thing here is the deed gets recorded, Buyer owns the property, the mortgage gets recorded, seller owns or recorded purchase money mortgage. That's regular stuff. That's what we've been talking about previously. But that's seller financing, where seller deeded it, but took back a purchase money mortgage as a part of the price. Now, chapter 22 is called a contract for deed. That's what I call them, that's what most people call them. Contract for deed. Buyer and seller sign a contract just like, just like before. But here's what the contract says. The contract says, buyer, you will make payments to me of $1,000 uh, $1, a month for the next 60 months. And at the end of that 60 months, 